Here comes the sun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's not bad, eh? My pronouns are he, him. I study physics. A virus is alive? Last week we talked about our evolution over the past 20 million years. Mm -hmm. And this week we'll be talking about week three, our evolution over the past 500 million years. That's uh, 25 times deeper into the past. I really enjoyed it. I love evolutionary biology uh, and I'm really interested in the... <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, that's the right answer. <laughs> I, yeah, so I was very interested in this week. What did you learn interesting or surprising? Oh, I think I just didn't think of things in a certain way until this, like, I, I know you just sort of have to unlearn certain things or like think of the actual common ancestor between a human and a dog and that it wouldn't look like either a human or a dog but it would look like a cross between yeah, them yeah. it's just sort of an idea that you don't think of i know you but... think of like here's a human there's a dog yeah. <laughs> that's why they used to think by the way they used to think species never diverged they were always god had made them mm. and then they just stayed that way how about unlearning i'm interested in unlearning did you what did you unlearn did you have any ideas that says, oh i was wrong about that i think the certain progression of where things came from. Like I think it just went, I thought it went microbes, fish, and sort of it didn't have much, I didn't think of the in-betweens and oh. sort of unlearning that it, was, it wasn't It was just, we don't know a lot about the in-betweens. We actually do know a bit about the in-betweens. Yeah, we do, we know but, quite a bit. But the idea that cousins and ancestors are different, because that's something that- Yes, that, yeah. that especially, I was, that's sort of the whole, yeah, linear versus spreading off but yeah thinking that chimpanzees aren't our ancestors or that well i mean fish sort of are our ancestors wow. in ways but not really because it was ancient <laughs> fish but right, right. yeah if chimps it diverged and then they didn't evolve and we evolved then our ancestor was like a chimp mm. on the other hand if chimps evolved and we kind of stayed the same then the, our common ancestor was more like a human same thing with fish now, uh, in my debate with Yakin, where we talked about <coughs> whether we should consider ourselves fish or not, I was saying, yes, we are. And he was saying, not really. What, did you take a side in this debate? I think I did. I find I often side with Yakin. Oh, <laughs> just, <laughs> Yakin. I think, yeah, it's interesting. <coughs> I think just because for this one, uh, it's all about, and it comes back to it like in the weeks past as well, it all, it's all about frame of reference. So what are you trying to say by saying that we are fish? Yes. Things like that. So it's in, really important for us to know that we were once, or not we were once fish, but we are... Well, Fish-like. We're fish-like. We're fish-like yes. ancestors. Yes. Uh, it's important to know that we are not this all, like, all-powerful uh, thing that just sort of well, is the most evolved. But how is it... Other than that, how is it useful for us to think that we're fish? It's useful like because of identity, from the same way that it's useful to think of yourself as an animal. We are animals, and that's why I'm insisting, yes, we are animals. But Jakin would say, well, you know what? Animals are something like non-human. They're off to the side. And every time we do that, we're making the same mistake. We're not including ourselves in nature. And so that's why I'm so yeah. insistent about this. Yeah, that is fair. Like, yeah, I saw sort of... I did see both sides. In, like I saw, oh, I see no. your, I see your wanting to push for fish because it makes us more entrenched in nature and like part of nature. The way we are, which is the way we are, yes. which people don't view it. But as. we don't want to be, right? That's the thing. So, what do you find interesting or uh, surprise? Anything surprising? I all right. I'm amazed that placoderms are now viewed as part of the uh, transit transition. Wait, transition fossils towards tetrapods? That I thought was really cool. Yeah, that was John Long. That's John Long's work. Yeah, I, oh, and the uh, the diagram he had where he had the, what was it, Go-Go Man? Mm -hmm. Go-Go Fish or Go-Go Man. Go -Go. It <laughs> Go -Go. That was a really good diagram. I, I've seen a few diagrams about the uh, bones in the skull, mm -hmm. but that one I thought was amazing. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know there were so many bones. <laughs> I thought like bone. <laughs> His bone is bone, but he said, no, no, this yeah. bone is arterial bone, endometrial was... bone. I said, oh, and these are your, your yep. plaque of bones. I said, that was interesting. I, I knew there were different types, mm. but I never knew there were that many. What about the videos about heads and hair and mammary glands and being a fish and yeah. I guess animals as well? So what do you think of those? I, all right, my favorite one yeah. was the one about heads because that seems to be the most readily useful for astrobiology. But the other ones made interesting points that definitely contributed to and, it. And useful because almost every <laughs> alien you've ever seen has a, had a head? Oh, just sort of it's more and more basal. 
So mm. if we want to look at aliens, we don't need to be asking, do they speak English? It's, mm -hmm. Do they have a head? That's a mm -hmm. pretty fundamental question. Yes, I think, I mean, well, it's more we fundamental more, than do they have hair, right? Exactly. <laughs> and so the more fundamental it gets, I find it more That's interesting. the direction we're going, Riley. Well, <laughs> that's good news for me. So in my debate with Yakin, did you take a side? I'll be honest. I think the two of you are... All right. I don't want to pretend to understand both of your points better than you do, but I think the pair of you seem to agree on just about everything. <laughs> it's just that Jochen, his point is that, again, don't mean to put words in anyone's mouth here, but his point seems to be that your use of language and saying humans are fish is mm -hmm. perhaps a bit that would be the thing that's being non-traditional. Well, again, it's not wrong. It's just that seems to be the argument. It's not. No, no, we're not descended from fish. It's it, you're just saying. So well, I'm saying we just see the whole point is if you have a phylogenetic tree, yeah. and you have something here, and then it goes, zoo, 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 then all of those things belong to a group, a sort of monophyletic yeah. group. And that's the what the, we should recognize. But yeah. if we're going to say all of these things except us belongs yeah. to that group. That's crazy. That's no good. That's human exceptionalism. That's what I'm fighting against. It is. He's not fighting against it as much as I am. And it seems to be a question of language rather than scientific knowledge. That's what he kept saying, and I'm saying yeah. it's, not, it's neither. It's a question of language, yes, but it's a question of who you identify with. Yeah. What do you think of yourself? That's the most profound thing you can do with your brain is have an identity. And if your identity says, no, I'm not, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't emerge from a fish-like creature. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then uh, that changes your identity. That makes you able to say, yes, I'm different than better than everybody. And that's, I think, one of yeah. the large things we're fighting. It, it's a fair point, but you're saying that we developed from something similar to a fish that resembles mm. a fish and that the... That we would call a fish group. if we saw it. Yeah. And yes. that the monophyletic group is, from what you're saying... Mostly fish, if you added it all up, including the. Well, I would say it's all species. fish by definition. But that's the thing. Would you say we're a fish? It's yes, the same I saying, definitely. It's, it's the same as saying, yeah. are we an ape? Well, the, I, the anthropologists say, no, we're not an ape. They're apes, and then there are humans. And I'm, yeah. But you look at the phylogenetic tree and say, wait a minute, what's the closest ancestor, what's the closest cousin of a chimp? Yeah. It's not a gorilla, it's a human being. That yeah. means that these two, chimps and humans, belong to a group together. But yeah. if you want to say, no, humans are over here, apes are over there, it's again and again and again the same thing. And so I guess I'm tired of it, and I think it's baloney, and it's yeah. non-scientific, and it's human exceptional. Uh, I'll stop. I think you and Jochen, and I think you and I agree on this. It's just... It, I don't think it is just semantic. It's no, emotional. No, no. It's very important for the emotion of who you think you are. That's why I'm insistent. I've, I'll be honest. I don't know much about that end of it, so I can't really... You don't know on. about your own emotions? Not really. Okay, let me ask you. Do you think you're an ape? <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. think you're an animal? Yeah. But you, every time you read a sign, hey... Animals, humans, humans, animals, animals. As they're used as mutually exclusive sets over and over again, yeah. thousands and thousands of times in your upbringing, and it's wrong. But yeah, it but is. it's also you have it deeply inside of you. They're animals, and then they're humans. So that's that's wrong, I think. It is. I. Know. It is. But let's just uh, call it semantics and deal yeah, with it. It seems like one of those things I don't know how to fix. So I just. Just call yourself an animal. Well, call yourself an ape. Call yourself a fish. Call yourself I a worm. Mean, depending on the context, I'll agree, but I'm, I'm not going to ask for someone to put a leash on me to get on a plane. That's Fish a don't get on leashes. <laughs> There's something you must be most skeptical about. Like some things, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Ooh, I wonder if that's true or not. Uh, the idea of something developing multiple times. Mm -hmm. So you say everything has a head in this in-group. So the common ancestor probably had there's a head. one. Well, there's com there was a common ancestor yeah. of all things that today have heads, and yeah. it had a proto proto head or something we might call you know kind of a head. Yeah. Have, and that you were skeptical about that? Oh no, I was just uh, as a question: Would there be any other groups that have heads that are not in there? Well, the answer to that I think is no. But I was pointed. But one point person pointed out: What about cabbages? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think that was fair either. Okay. 
I'm glad you included the extended interview with John Long. I Oh, did you get to look at it then? I didn't finish it. It was okay. getting late, so I didn't watch the whole thing. But I'm very glad because, again, some of those interviews, I watched them, I think, God, I wish I had another hour of this. And well, then, that's what... That's... And then I did! <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty, uh, that right, was pretty so, good. Yes, we. I wanted to explicitly include those extra... Uh, yep. One of these videos is like two and a half hours long. I mean, get it... the popcorn ready! <laughs> uh, with the whole having the multiple copies of a genome, Mm -hmm. or was it full genome replication? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My question was, does having multiple copies of the same genome actually serve any useful purpose? Does it give you sort of free space to copy into? Well, I think anything that has survived in life has served a useful purpose. There's probably some adaptation we can think of. The, I mean, the, the obvious adaptation there is, okay, if you have a gene, just think of just one gene and duplicate. Gene duplication happens all the time. Yeah. What then happens is, Two things. One is you have two copies of the same gene, then you have like twice as many of that protein produced. And so, hey, it may, is it good to have twice as many of the protein? Okay. Or another option is it gets, it gets duplicated and then it gets, one gets turned off. And then you have the same number being produced. But while it's turned off for, let's say, a million or two million years, it can change a little bit, modified. And then down the track, it can get turned on again. And then it does something slightly different. It makes a protein that has a little of this instead of a little of that. Yeah. And then that might be useful. It might not. If it's not useful, you die or something. And if it is useful, then, oh, by the way, you have two related like hemoglobin molecules that are slightly different. This is, this is better under, I don't know, low oxygen of, uh, conditions. This is better when there's high oxygen. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. And... That makes sense. You have multiple copies of it, so you can fiddle around with one and you're still having everything function inside your body. Yeah. That's yeah. another strange open-ended question I've got for you here is about the whole widening circle of empathies that Jochen mentioned. Mm. So my question to you is if we find extraterrestrial life, for lack of a better description, mm -hmm. Do you think that'll widen this circle of empathies, or do you think it'll narrow it? And I do have a follow-up for it. So. Okay, well, well, I think the easy answer to that is if they kill us, then it will <laughs> narrow us and make us more defensive and say, get the hell out of my, my circle of empathy. I'm not going to empathize with somebody who's going to try to kill me. That's uh, and, uh, pretty fair. But I also want about this, this circle of empathy. It's kind of like the, it is a decreasing amount of empathy as you get further and further away from yourself, I think. Huh. Like That's... you probably think you're more important than, I don't know, maybe your sister. And you and your sister, you think are more important than the neighbor's person over there. And you and your neighbor probably think you're more important than the next community. And you, uh, this community goes to the same church or goes to the same bowling alley or something. You think your bowling alley is the better than the bowling alley over there. And so, and then you say, well, wait a minute, we're all human beings. And, um, and they say, well, that's a bigger circle. But wait a minute, why not great ape? So mm, anyway, and uh, we're all vertebrates, you know. So do you think, well, the follow-up to it is, do you think that these whatevers that we discover being more similar to us, do you think that would affect how much it changes the circle? Well, so that's certainly what most cosmoethicists believe. They think they're going to find, cosmoethicists think we're going to find like <laughs> intelligent aliens, and because they're intelligent, they immediately get close into our circle of empathy. And that's what okay. they believe because based on how smart they are and how much feeling and sentience they have. It's kind of like a sentience-ometer. And if they're as smart as we are or more, then they get to be in our circle. I, I don't uh, see that as happening, though. So we discover little green men who shake hands with us. Or we discover a wonderful viral planet. Yep. Or... And, then, and then are they in our empathy? Well, we yeah. don't like viral... They'll say, look at the way you're mistreating viruses on your planet. Yep. Well, I don't want to come close to you, so they will... Uh, I don't know what they'll do. Well, I'd, yeah. Wait, so if we discover something, little green men, do we suddenly start treating bacteria better on Earth? Or do we treat I them worse? I doubt it. I doubt it. I don't think we're going to tr start treating bacteria better. Actually, I'm not quite sure because as people talk about human rights and then they say, hey, we got to include other races or identities or ethnic groups and say, we're all human. And then they say, well, wait a minute, what about Neanderthal? And, uh, and so I keep on asking my wife, Okay, what if we could bring back Neanderthal? Well, I think we might be able to do that. If we brought back a Neanderthal, would they be able to vote? Would they have human rights? And I'd say, okay, let's bring back Homo erectus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh... And so human exceptionalism will be undermined by finding relatives that were closer to us. And I guess that's what people think when we're going to find an alien who's really smart. So what do you think of week three? Week three, I think coming into this, it's as a physicist with, I think, like 
I haven't done biology since year 10 science. Mm. This is the week that maybe I, I learned the most content wise so far. And that's something that I'm grateful for. Uh, coming into it with uh, what I, it's sort of like, I'm kind of ashamed of my, my lackluster understanding of biology. And I think this was really helpful and also digestible for me. Well, wait, wait, last week, you said you were interested in your position in society and how social relations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now you say, as a physicist, I know nothing about biology. You know, to go from physics to social relations, you have to go through biology. But, but <laughs> it, like intellectual curiosity doesn't go that linearly, right? I don't need to go via biology to understand history. You don't? I think you do, but go ahead. Skeptical, maybe not the word, but I, I found myself wondering where selection pressure fits into this. Mm -hmm. Because these, these, um, these trees don't just grow any which way, right? They're channeled into niches. That's the big issue. That's, yeah. that's called the convergence versus deep homology problem that we'll see, I think, in, like later on, like okay. a couple of weeks from now. Okay. So but that is the big issue, mm -hmm. and that's important because if you can figure out something that did some, that if you can figure out some feature of the life on Earth and its evolution, that did multiple times independently, that mm -hmm. becomes a good example of something mm -hmm. uh, you should Perfection. expect elsewhere. The problem is, what does the word independent mean? But it's more, it's more than, you know, crabs evolving several times, which I know you don't, you don't actually agree with, but that's just the example off the top of my head. It's more like if you're on a planet with a certain amount of land mass, mm -hmm. wouldn't, like, wouldn't you expect something to fill that niche? Well, right. You have to identify what the niche is, and if you identify the niches, uh, there's a species in it. There's a species doing something on Earth. Therefore, it's a niche. Mm -hmm. That's the part that I disagree with because we don't know how specific that, you know, or even that it is a niche. It's certainly a species, mm -hmm. and it's sexually isolated, and it's doing something. The question is it unique. How unique is it? Uh, is an, is a harder issue to answer. Is a harder thing to answer. I suppose going back to the whole physics of it, looking at. Um, Looking at worms, right? All humans are worms. We're just uh, worm, oh, really? worm, worm. I've never heard anybody say that besides me, so yeah, I'm well, glad you like, saw Yeah, that. I'm, I'm, I'm picking that up. I'm, I'm, I'm marching under that I'm flag. a monophyletic kind of guy. Yeah, we're, just, we're just really weird worms. I will, well, I I will grant we're you weird. that. I said we're normal worms. Well, we're, we're weird compared to all the other worms that still exist. Have you looked at all the other worms? I show one image of all the different worms. They are so friggin' weird, I can believe it. I said, well, I knew nothing about it. I just looking at them. Wow, they are weird. But would they be weird? <coughs> would they be weird for a worm? Is yes, that your human absolutely. biases coming through? No, right? I'm saying that those worms think they're uh, wow. There are other species they don't even know about them. They said, get out of here. They'd kill them or they'd fight, mm -hmm. just like we kill lots of things when we go hunting. Okay, so we're all weird to each other. I'll, well, yeah. I don't know what the word weird means. It's hard to put a metric on things yes, like that. It so, is. It and is. so usually our metric is pure human, and that's exactly what we have to jettison mm -hmm. if we're trying to understand mm -hmm. the universe. But with these worms, what's to say that we wouldn't ex expect that shape, or that, that body shape mm -hmm. to appear if you've got a planet that developed eukaryotes, which right. we'll talk about next right, week. Right, right. So, so the classic like, example of that is dolphins look like pterosaurs. Not pterosaurs, but ichthyosaurs. Yeah, okay. Right? These are yeah. reptiles that came on land and then went back to the water, and because they are big and had to move fast through water, you had to be shaped like a torpedo, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so and, that's and, a and physical worms, constraint. Worms similarly, they minimize drag, don't they? Well, a lot, some of them do. If they, it depends on what type of soil they live in and whether mm -hmm. they're in the water or whether they're in rock or whether mm -hmm. they're in, in dirt. Would we expect to see like certain shapes, for example, this worm-like shape, mm -hmm. because of the constraints of physics? It seems to me that it's not just a matter of it, like a matter of adaption to the environment and laws of physics. Mm -hmm. To me, it seems like surely if we if we get to the point of say eukaryotes, mm. and then those eukaryotes, the yeah. most efficient way that they can get around is in a worm shape, and then you end up with fish, and fish are kind of worm shaped, mm -hmm. and then those fish want to like land opens up and they they want to fill that niche, and and you develop pedal animals, yeah. right? So you are a Simon Conway Morris person. And you should read his stuff. Okay. Because he he says things like that again and again. And I kind of... Should I really just be trying to create an information ecosystem where I'm just being reaffirmed of my gut views? Well, no, you should uh, create should an ecosystem yeah. so you know more about what your gut views are. Okay. So because they've already been looked into in some detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also at the same time, you can look into, like Stephen Jay Gould,